everybody. It is a great day today. We are breathing. We have got blessings abundantly in our lives, more than we can imagine. And today we're going to talk about unraveling our old self. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 25. As you're turning there, uh, as was referred to in our um, advertisement before, the, before everything, we have Membership 101 today. Come, be a part, and uh, love to have you. Uh, Christmas Eve service, 6 o'clock uh, on Christmas Eve, of course. Don't forget that. It's on Christmas Eve, our Christmas Eve service. Okay. Um, also, we talked a little bit about starting the, the, the new year right. We've got some Bible reading plans on each of the speakers down here. You need to start planning now how you're going to uh, get in the Word next year, right? We don't, you don't just accidentally study the Word of God, okay? You do it intentionally because we will have a million distractions around us that will try to keep us from getting in the Word, and so I encourage you, as you begin the new year, as we begin the new year, you make reading the Bible, getting in the Word of God, a priority in your life. It will change you. It will grow you. And God will do things through His Word in you as you pray and as the Spirit of God teaches you. Uh, it, it'll be, next year will be far better than you could ever imagine. So I just encourage you to do that. Um, we're continuing in Ephesians. Jared did a great job last week of uh, preaching as usual. Uh, today, we're talking about unraveling our old selves. That word unravel, um, it's the idea of, of separating or untangling uh, threads in a garment, or it's the idea of taking something apart, right? To, to undo it, to almost to destroy it. You see, when we get saved, we are a new spiritual creation. We're not just made better, we are made new. But that is a spiritual transaction. When we get saved, we don't get, our bodies aren't automatically healed, right? When we get saved, I mean, we still have to deal with the flesh. We have to still deal uh, with all the things that come against us. And so we have to understand that this our life before we came to Christ, we were bound up and we were wrapped in garments of sin. They had become so familiar to us that they have become the sin is a part of us. And when we come to know Christ, with the help of the Lord, the Spirit within us, and Paul's going to encourage us today, there has to be an unraveling of our old self to get to the new self. It is a partnership between us and the Lord. The Spirit of God will give us strength when we ask for it, but there is action that we have to take. We can't just pray and just ask the Lord to, to, to help us to do these things. That's, that's the first part of it. He will help us, but there has to be action on our part. And we have to unravel that sinfulness in us that has entangled us, because we're not that anymore. When you come to know Christ, you are made new. You become a son or daughter of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You no longer have to dwell in the pigsty. You have been transferred to, to the king's residence, the, the most glorious palace of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We don't have to act like we did when we wallowed with the pigs. We have something else in our life. And God tells us here, Paul, his, in the previous verses that Jared preached last week, he talked in general, in general terms about the old self and the new self. And now in the passage today, Paul gets very specific. Right? Because we love when uh, people talk in general terms because that applies to everybody else. Right? Put on the old self, you know, take off the old self, put on the new self, and oh, that's all fine and good. But now, Paul is naming names. That's where it gets a little bit uncomfortable. 
appropriate passage today as we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper too, is these things that Paul encourages us in and not to do are things that we need to, to work on as individuals in Christ. Go with me, your copy of God's Word there, beginning chapter 4 in verse 25. Since you put away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. The thief must no longer steal. Instead, he must do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No foul language is to come from your mouth but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by Him for the day of redemption. All bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God also forgave you in Christ." Paul, as he's putting this list here, he has gone from the general to the specific, and all of these sins that Paul relates are sins of relationship. Paul is addressing the church here at Ephesus, helping them to see how to be a better church. He's giving this list of sins here because these are sins that affect the body of believers readily. Right? This is for us. Now, this doesn't mean that you can lie and be angry and do all that stuff with people that are not in the church. It's not just talking about just do this in the church. It is a lifestyle that we live among the church and everywhere we are. The first one he begins here is go from lying to truth-telling. From lying to truth-telling. We live... In a truth challenged world. You can have one event and you can have 17 different takes on the event, and there may be a thread of truth in a couple of those. Right? We even have now become a, a, a society in the world and so technologically advanced that they can make what they call these deep fakes videos. Right, these deep fake videos is they can impose somebody's face, they can do this video, and they can attribute to this one person and make a, it's not even that person, but they make it look like it, and they will say or do all kinds of things, and it's not even them. That's the kind of world we live in. It is a world where truth is not prevalent. Now, we have to understand that the world is lost. Generally, the world is lost in need of a Savior. And we see that that is no more true than the lack of truth. You can, watch, you can watch every news network and there's truth, just a shed, just a shade of it in there somewhere. And we have to be people of the Lord who seek truth, first of all, the Lord's truth, but then we have to be people that speak the truth. One to another, to his neighbor. Now, we can talk about the kinds of lying and the kinds of, uh, of untruth in this world today. I mean, you just look at deception. Shredding, like, the, like Satan did in the garden. He wove a little bit of truth into a lie. Did God really say that you can't even touch the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden? And, and that's what happens in the world today. The, the best lies are not just the blatant untruths. The worst lies are the ones that have a shed, a shred, a line, a thread of truth going through the lie. Because you don't know what is true. Deception. Exaggeration. Right? Exaggeration is lying. Half-truths. Plagiarism, turning in somebody else's work as your own. Hypocrisy, that's the church gets that one a lot. Well, I'm not going to church because I, I know some of your church members. They don't act any different than I do. Hypocrisy, 
saying one thing and living another way. Breaking our promises. You make a promise to somebody and you don't do it. That's, that's lying. And, and Paul wants them to understand that it was maybe well accepted in those days. That you can lie. Even today there have been all kinds of studies and, and, and polls and, and people. Uh, over 65% of the people said that lying is okay in order to avoid hurting somebody's feelings. Okay, which, it's not true. Not true. We have to understand that the truth is given to us from the Lord, and that the opposite of truth is lies, which the devil is one of his monikers, is he is the father of lies. You see, when, when we lie, we are choosing to take the hand of the evil one who wants to, wants to lead us down another path. One of the biggest lies that we hear in churches today is, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. You may not be fine. A lot of people that say, oh, I'm fine, they're not fine. And it's a lie. So let's change that. So if you're not okay and somebody asks you, you, how are you doing? You all right? You can say, well, you know, I'm not doing great, but I could use your prayers. That's a simple truth right there. And you know what that does is it, it makes us a little bit vulnerable to each other, and we can pray for them. We're not going to ask for every gory detail. We're not, we want to be here for each other, be able to pray and minister to each other. You see, in a world that is comfortable with lies, with comfortable with deceptions, we as Christians need to be purveyors of the truth in every way. There was a farmer that farmed watermelons. He had problems every year with these teenage boys would come and just steal a whole bunch of watermelons. It affected his crop. So one year this farmer had the idea. He made a sign. Huge sign right there at the entrance of his watermelon farm. It said, one of these watermelons is poison. <laughs> he just figured that's going to work. If they don't know which one's poison, they're not going to come get it. Well, of course, he didn't poison any one of them. He gets up. He's proud of himself. You know, several days pass by. All of his watermelons are still there, still growing, doing well. Third day he wakes up and the sign had been altered. He goes outside and an X had been marked over one and the, the number two had been written. <laughs> now, the farmer was in a predicament. He didn't know which one the boys had messed with. So he had lost his entire crop of watermelons. Understand your lies will always come back to bite you. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. And he says, why to do it? He said, because we are members of one another. We are a tight-knit group of believers in Christ. We value truth. We value each other. We value the love of God and the love of each other. And wouldn't it just be easier if we just told each other the truth and said, you know, I'm not doing that great. How can I minister to you? How can I love you? Be able to do those things. Paul goes on. The next thing is he goes from anger to reconciliation. Anger to reconciliation. Be angry. Do not sin. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. Don't give the devil an opportunity. We have to understand that just being angry, anger itself is not the sin. Somebody said that the difference between righteous sin I mean, righteous anger and unrighteous anger is when somebody's mad at me, that's unrighteous anger. But when I'm mad, that's righteous anger. <laughs> Not quite the right definition. But we have to be careful because anger can affect all of us. There is a wrong anger. An anger that's selfish. An anger that seeks revenge. An anger that ridicules, an anger that despises, an anger that exalts itself over others, an anger that is quick, an anger that does not glorify the Lord, an anger that broods, 
and just stirs and you just get mad and you just, you just keep it inside and that anger just grows. It just grows. Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. He's saying, get it resolved. If you get angry with somebody, you talk about it. You deal with it. You don't just let it resolve. You don't let it just sit in your, in your body, in your mind, in your heart. Because as he says here, it will give the devil an opportunity in your life, not in theirs. Understand that. Anger, this ungodly, unrighteous anger, is not a good anger, and it will eat you up from the inside. One bit at a time. Anger, 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 anger. A couple went before a judge in divorce court. The judge wanted to understand what had happened. So he begins to talk to them there in the court. And, and the husband and wife that, that were there, they had not spoken to each other in 12 years. Had lived in the same house separate rooms, and they had been living an awful life. The judge asked, well, what, what started all of this? Why did y'all, how did y'all get to the point of, of not speaking to each other for 12 years? The husband spoke up. He said, well, we got mad at each other. He said, well, okay. He said, well, what'd you get mad about? Husband didn't remember. So the judge asked the wife, what did you get mad about? She didn't remember either. But you see, from that moment where they got mad 12 years before, you see that, that whole issue had gone away, but the anger was still there. You have to deal with the anger. Talk to each other. Don't let the sun go down in your anger because it will start to put a little seed of, of resentment in your heart that will indeed grow and the devil will take every opportunity to water that to try to put a bridge between you and someone else and a wall and, and causes that division between you and a brother or sister in Christ or a friend or a family member, a co-worker. You have to deal with your anger. There is a righteous anger. We know that Jesus had two, uh, gave us two scenarios of anger. We saw one, Jesus was in the temple. He was watching the money changers in the temple. And one instance tells us that he sat there and wove a whip. And as he finished weaving the whip, he used that whip to drive the money changers out of the temple. Another time. Same kind of thing. Jesus got mad at the money changers. They had turned the worship of the Lord into a money-making enterprise. And he turned over their tables and with anger ran them out of the temple. So remember, Jesus got mad too. But it was for righteous, righteous reasons. An, indi an in indicator of righteous anger is that it is, it is controlled. It is a controlled anger. It is an anger that is justified because you are angry over an injustice. You are angry over a sin. Maybe you're angry over a person that has given their lives to sin and is constantly going against the Lord. Any, any of these scenarios can be righteous anger, but you still have to deal with it has to be a legitimate reason just because you're angry doesn't mean it is righteous anger Paul goes on the thief must no longer steal instead he must do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need historians tell us in that culture that stealing was somewhat acceptable somewhat acceptable if you didn't have much it was okay for you to steal and Paul here says, no, it is not okay to steal. 
He says that if, if you have come to know Christ, the thief must no longer steal. He must do work with his hands. And look what he says. He doesn't say that to feed himself, but he must do work with his own hands so that he has something to share with somebody else. The thief can no longer steal. He must change and work to unravel those old habits. Understand when the world and the culture tells us things are okay, and God's Word says something else, we have to go with God's Word. When the world tells us, oh, it's okay to lie, it's okay to steal, it's okay to do this, it's okay. We can automatically understand that that's the world trying to lead us away from the truth of God's Word. You see, work was what we were intended to do. Adam and Eve were put in the garden to work and tend the garden. We have been created to work. Work is a gift from God. A lot of people may not say that on Monday morning, but work is a gift from God. Paul gets really on to the Thessalonians. They had, they had planted the church there in, in Thessalonica, but there were some people that had decided that, that they were no longer going to work and they were just going to feed off of the church. Paul tells them this. He says, if anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. That's a hard truth. It's a very hard truth. Proverbs 28, 19 says, The one who works his land will have plenty of food, but whoever chases fantasies will have his fill of poverty. See, Paul connects the understanding of stealing, not with having enough, but having it through our work that we may give to one another. End of the month, we have a fifth Sunday this month. Every fifth Sunday, we do a family aid offering. That is to help our, our family in need. You know, something happens, and, and there are these things that happen in life, and, and you can't pay your electric bill, and this happens, and that happens. Maybe you got sick and lost your job. We as a church want to help and so when we give at, the, at the, the fifth Sunday, we give in such a way that we have worked for those and then we try to help those in our body that are in need. It's biblical what we do. We have to be able to, to not steal. One of the greatest pictures of that is Zacchaeus, Luke 19. Jesus is going through Jericho. Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector, which in other words, he was the, the, the chief thief. Because the way the tax collector had worked back then is they were responsible, they were given the job from the Romans. And the Romans would tell them, okay, this person owes this much tax. And so say it was 10 denarii. And so they would say, okay, if they owe 10 denarii, I'm going to collect 50 denarii. I'm going to pocket the 40. And if they don't pay me, then I'm going to tell the Romans that they didn't pay their taxes. And the Romans will come and take them from their house. And they will torture them until they can get their money. And so the chief tax collector was over all the tax collectors. And the tax collectors would steal from the people. And so Jesus is walking through Jericho and he sees Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus wants to see this Jesus. And so he was a small man. He climbs up on the tree and Jesus notices him. And he says, hey, he said, Zacchaeus, today I'm eating lunch at your house. Zacchaeus came down. And he didn't confess his faith in Christ verbally there. But we saw that the evidence of change was there because he said, okay, anybody that I have stolen from, I will, re I will re get it back to them four times over. And he said, I'm going to give half of all my wealth to feed the poor. And Jesus said something interesting after that. He said, today salvation has come to the house of Zacchaeus. Amen. You see, his generosity came after he came to know Christ. We should be a generous people. How many of us during this Christmas season are only asking for us for Christmas? How many of you have a list to give to other people? You see, God provides everything in abundance of what we need. In abundance. How come we can't be so generous that it would make people wonder what the heck we're doing? Have we lost our marbles? To be generous with those around us. Love your neighbors, literally the people that live around you. Do something for them. 
I think that it would radically change your take on Christmas and our take on Christmas if we understood that Christmas is a celebration of what what Christ came to do for us, the, the love and the grace and he gave of himself fully. And Christmas should not be about getting presents, but Christmas should be about giving presents. There needs to be a reverse Amazon. Right, everybody logs on Amazon, hour and a half later they deliver it to your door. And it's stuff that you purchase. Right, wouldn't it be great if there was an opposite Amazon? We could just shop for everybody else and it's done. You see, we need to have the heart that, that Paul's trying to get the church to understand here. We have to have a life of generosity. Giving and giving and giving. Next thing Paul goes on to here. No foul language to come from your mouth, but only, to share, only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. I know what you're thinking. Hey, I don't cuss. Gave up cussing a long time ago. I'm good. I'm going to play my phone for a while while he's talking about this point. But the, the interesting thing here, the word foul there is not a word that means dirty language or cussing. It is the word that Jesus uses twice is the only other time it's used, and it means rotten. Rotten. Jesus talked about rotten apples. He talked about rotten fish. Right? It, anytime you know something is rotten, it stinks. He's saying here, if you have stinky language that comes from your mouth, stop it. You need, to have say, you need to say some things that are building people up. He's not just talking about cussing here. He's talking about abusive language. Vulgar references. He's talking about sarcasm. He's talking about criticism. He's talking about poking fun at people. He's talking about gossip. He's talking about all those things that we do instead of cuss. He said, look what he says. I mean, he says it should not even to come from your mouth. Jesus had something radical to say. Matthew 12, 34 the, uh, the Pharisees are attacking him. And he says this, he says, Brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? He said, because from the mouth speaks the overflow of the heart. You see, the things you say are not just your words that come from here. The things we say are things that start here. Out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. Did you know that one of the worst, one, worst things that we see in Scripture described is the tongue? James says that the tongue is a consuming fire. Proverbs 18.21, life and death, death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will live by it. How many of us can remember awful things that people have said to us? How many of us today can remember awful things that people have said to us 15, 20 years ago? That old kid saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, that's another lie. Words hurt worse than sticks and stones. We have to be careful as Christians what we say. Now, he doesn't say just to not do those things, but he says, but say those things here that are good for building up someone in need. He says, not only are our words not supposed to be uh, putrid and rotten, but our words should actually give life and encourage people. Amen. Encourage people. We are not supposed to be people that are fruit inspectors. Going around and, and poking at everybody's mistakes and, and magnifying everybody's mistakes because it makes us feel good in our small little heart. We are to be people that in spite of mistakes, because we're all human and knuckleheads, amen? amen. In, in spite of all of that, we are to encourage and find the good in people. Doesn't mean that we're not truthful. 
It means that we take our words and we want to, we want to be a blessing with our words instead of being a curse. A professor went into his class. He had a big whiteboard there on the wall, and he, in the middle of the whiteboard, he colors a black circle. Turns around and asks the class, what do you all see? To a person, all of the students says, we see a black dot. Professor says, why don't you all see any of the white around the black? You see, as a people, we can become very critical if we're not careful. We look for the black dot in everybody else because in some small way it makes us feel better about ourselves. Now look what it does. Our words can grieve the Holy Spirit. Verse 30. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You are sealed by Him for the day of redemption. Grieve the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that your words, you can say something and the Holy Spirit within you is like, oh. I wish they wouldn't have said that. We can grieve the Holy Spirit with your words specifically as it's connected here in the Scriptures. One thing we need to do, I believe, is before we say something, we, could, we need to ask ourselves this question. Well, what I'm about to say, please the Spirit. Would it be pleasing to God? Or will what I'm about to say grieve the Holy Spirit? And that's one of our problems is we often don't think before we speak. Amen. We get angry and we... And then we spend years trying to make up for just those words we spoke in anger. We've got to be people that watch what we speak. We don't create anything. A lot of people today said that you speak your destiny. You speak the future. No, you don't. That's not true. But the power of life and death reside in the tongue and we will live by it. We have to be encouraging and strengthening people that our, that our words are not going to be rotten. He goes on and Verse 31, he says, all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. We have to go from bitterness to kindness. Bitterness to kindness. Look at the levels of he's talking about. Bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander. I believe that these are a progression that Paul is making. I think it starts with bitterness in our hearts, and the bitterness comes out with anger and wrath, shouting and slander. But it all starts in your heart, and it bubbles up through your mouth, and all of these things here bubble up through the anger that he's spoken about earlier that gave way to bitterness, which gives more anger and wrath. He says, instead, be kind and compassionate to one another. We have lost those words. We live in a society that would yet rather yell and scream at each other than to speak with one another and be kind. Christians, we cannot be unkind people. We cannot. We are risking people coming to know Christ if we are mean and vindictive just like the world. There would be nothing different in us if we follow the lead of the world. We've got to be people that are kind, compassionate, compassionate. That means with great passion for people. We don't need to be quick to, to bring down. We need to be quick to encourage and strengthen, compassionate, full of kindness. The prophet Micah, he's not one of the, the well-known prophets. He's one of the what we call the minor prophets. He was about the same time as Isaiah, but Micah, if when you read his book, he's very straightforward about things. He's very simple. Micah in chapter 6, verse 8, kind of hones down and puts together what it means to walk with the Lord. Very simply. And he says, here, he said, he has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, as Christians, we, it matters how we live. It matters what we say. It matters how we are angry. It matters all of these things. Just simply to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God would change the world around us. 
So we get to the last point, how? How? Forgiving one another just as God also forgave you in Christ. Yeah, that forgiving word. Well, they don't deserve forgiveness. Well, you didn't either. I'm not ready to forgive yet. Well, okay, it's a choice. You're just going to build up bitterness till that can happen. He says, remember, right? He says, remember how God has forgiven you, so you need to forgive other people. How can we, as Christians, who have our faith and salvation wrapped up in a Savior who forgave us of our sins when we didn't deserve it, how can we have the audacity? How can we have the arrogance to say, well, God can forgive me, but I can't forgive them? <laughs> We have to remember. We have to remember who we were, what we were. It's a perfect time as we enter into the Lord's Supper today. Maybe you're wrestling with some of these things that the Lord's brought to mind today. Maybe you're wrestling with lying or sarcasm or you're critical about everything. You, you don't talk to people very nicely. You're not a kind person. Whatever it is that the Lord's brought to mind today, guess what? He can forgive it. But what does it take? It takes us taking it to the Lord and saying, God, I'm, for, I'm just so sorry. Forgive me that I am not encouraging to the people around me. Forgive me that I'm always critical and bringing people down. And you know what he does? You're forgiven. Just like that. Because of what Christ has done for us. Amen. We can never forget that. This world wants to, wants to turn us into somebody who is against the Lord. But if we humble ourselves, love justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God, the Lord will change us and those around us. Paul is trying to teach the Corinthian church about the Lord's Supper. They didn't get it. He tells them that you need to examine yourself before you take the Lord's Supper. Paul says in chapter 11, verse 27, 1 Corinthians, he says, Therefore, whoever eats of the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. So a man should examine himself, and this way he should eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. This is why so many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly evaluating ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we may not be condemned with the world. Paul says there, if we would just check our own hearts consistently, then we would be able to avoid a lot of the mess that we get into. Amen. Before we enter into the Lord's Supper, we're going to take the next few minutes, and that's what we're going to do. Just go ahead and, and, and bow your heads and close your eyes. As the Word of God was just preached, is there anything that the Spirit of God put in your heart? Is there any conviction there? Well, this is the time where you say, God, forgive me. Let's take these next few minutes, bring ourselves individually before the King, and ask Him. And then repent and ask for forgiveness. Let's do that. Perfect and holy, heavenly Father, we come before you. We are thankful that as we have just repented and confessed our sin before you, that you have forgiven us. That you've not only forgiven us, but you have made us clean. Father, I ask for each one of us here today 
that you help us to unravel that sinful nature that we wrestle with. And Lord, let this remembrance of your grace and mercy for us, Lord, help it. Help us. Help this remembrance to to affect us, Father. These are not just elements, Lord. They are a physical reminder of what you went through, Jesus, for us. Father, we give you this time as we remember the sacrifice of our Savior. And we pray all this in the beautiful, the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. If I can get the deacons to come forward, please. Father, we enter into this time and we ask that you quiet our hearts. All the noise, all the things in our mind right now, Father, I pray that that all melts away. Help us to focus on what you've done for us, Jesus. Your complete sacrifice to the death. Even while we were still sinners, you died for us. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We give you this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. He took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant established in my blood. Do this. And as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your forgiveness in Christ. We thank you for your love that doesn't end. We thank you, Father, that you have given us your spirit to reside in us, to give us strength to help to unravel our own lives. Thank you, Father. I ask as we enter into our invitation that, Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, that today they will. They will put their faith in you. They will know the forgiveness. They will know the grace and the mercy, the joy and the peace that you give in Christ. Lord, take this time. Change us. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.